All right, um, so we're been, we've been doing a series. Uh, of course, our world is challenged uh, right now with, you know, pandemic. So we, we have been teaching on what the Bible says about healing. And uh, in Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, he says, My son, attend to my words, consent and submit to my sayings, consent and submit. I mean, there's agreement to there, and there's application to them, and submit yourself to them. In other words, acknowledge that they're right. And how many you know, sometimes you've heard things, you know, even all your life, and then you actually read the Bible, and you're like, I didn't know that, or I thought it was opposite. <laughs> and so we submit to what God says. My son, attend to my words, consent and submit to my sayings. Let them not depart from your sight. Amen. So in other words, this is a lifestyle of, of meditating, of studying, of reading the scriptures, keep them always in front of our eyes. Keep them also in the center of your heart, for they are life to those who find them, healing and health to all their flesh. In some Bibles you'll see in the margin, it'll have the word medicine. It's medicine to your flesh. And this is the Hebrew word for medicine here when it says health and healing to all their flesh. And so the word of God, as you, as you do put them in front of your eyes and if you bring them into your heart, they have a medicinal quality. Amen? So that's one thing we're doing here. And, uh, you know, sometimes, though, sometimes people wait until, you know, they have a, a problem uh, to start thinking about healing and that's true in the natural and spiritually. How many of you know we can receive medicine naturally or physically, but we can also receive medicine spiritually? So I recently uh, experienced COVID symptoms, and, and I, I began care spiritually and naturally. Several kinds of medicine at once. And, uh, of course, I was gone for a little while, mostly just because of the quarantine, but I, I was down for two days, and, and the Lord is good. Amen. And so I, I experienced recovery, experienced healing. How many of you know that all recovery comes from God? But in the natural, there's also something known as well care or preventative uh, care. And uh, sometimes we only uh, focus on our health or do things that are going to be healthy for us when we have a problem. And that's really, you know, after the, that's kind of following. But really, we should also be working towards preventative or well care. And so take God's medicine so that you, you're, you have, you're strong. Of course, the Proverbs also says, Proverbs 18, 14, that the strong spirit of a person will sustain them in bodily pain or trouble. And so this is an area of the word of God to, to have the, this God's word is medicine and how many of you know that, that God's word actually speaks to your physical health? How many of you know there's different kinds of medicine for different kinds of situations? Right? When the doctor diagnoses you, then they go, okay, take this. He doesn't just give everybody the same thing. And so we need to have some preventative care. And so that we're ready... Uh, when, if, or, you know, when we have a challenge and, 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 you know, Jesus says in this world, in this life, you're going to have tribulation. Amen. But we don't have to fear pestilence. We don't have to fear disease. We don't give any reverence. And, and definitely we've seen in, in our world, the whole world really has responded in irrational fear to COVID-19. Come on. And we need to respond as believers in faith. And so if we do, uh, and several of us have had COVID recovered, and so we just, when, when you have a challenge, you need to treat it. Not in, in fear, but in faith that, uh, hey, I know Jesus. And healing belongs to me. It's in redemption. Amen. Uh, so we're looking right now, we've been looking at types and shadows, and I want to look at that some more tonight. And so before we do that, I want to read this to you from Luke chapter 24. 
Luke chapter 24, and this is after the resurrection. Verse 44, then he said to them, these are the words, Luke uh, 24, verse 44. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses. That's it. And that not just in like a law code, but written in the first five books. In other words, written in the books that Moses wrote. Okay. And really we could translate this, uh, the Torah of Moses, the teaching of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me, that is Jesus. So we know that, but, but some of the things in the, the Torah, in the prophets and in the Psalms are types. And look at this. And so he explained this to them and look at the next verse. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. In other words, he showed them the types and all kinds of, of ways that he's written about in the Old Testament. But he's showing them the types and the antitypes so that they would comprehend the Old Testament scriptures. So let's pray right now that he'll do the same for us. So Father, we come to you, we come to your word, and we ask you, Holy Spirit, just as in that time, you opened their understanding of the scriptures. We look to your scriptures and we ask you to give us understanding and we ask you to strengthen our, our, our faith that we would be fully persuaded and convinced of your will to heal, that our spirits would be strengthened by your spirit. Hallelujah for any and every challenge. Thank you also for giving us authority over every manner of sickness and every manner of disease to heal it. Ha ha. In Jesus' name, amen. So he gave them understanding. Isn't that good? So we're looking at the atonement in the Old Testament. The atonement in the Old Testament. Remember, St. Augustine said that the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. The new is in the old concealed. In other words, one of the ways that that, what he means there is there is New Testament events concealed in types in the Old Testament. So let me just review for a moment. Well, we'll review in a minute um, what that means. And, and, and if you didn't miss it, I would encourage you to go listen to last week on uh, YouTube. And uh, we explained in detail about types and antitypes that it is a teaching of the Bible and that God has done it on purpose and designed it. Let's read this in the New Testament, though, about Jesus and his ministry in Luke chapter 5, verse 12. And it happened... When he, speaking of Jesus, was in a certain city, that behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus. Oh, that's good news right there. And, and actually today, we're in a better situation than this man who saw Jesus because you had to be back then, you had to be in the same certain city. You had to be on the same street. You had to be at the same place and location at the same time and get close to him physically. But today, the spirit of Jesus is as near to you, right? As, as and in fact, Paul said this, the word of faith is in your heart and in your mouth. And then also we can associate, we can fellowship with him in his word. So it happened when he was in a certain city that behold a man who was full, everybody say full of leprosy. In other words, this is an advanced case. This is a severe case, full of leprosy. And leprosy was a death sentence. But he saw Jesus and he fell on his face and implored him saying, Lord, Lord. And now this is the name for God. And so he recognizes Jesus as more than a rabbi, more than a teacher. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I love this, that, that God has given us this event and, and, and recorded for us and, and put down the dialogue of that day, that this man's question, I believe you have the power, I believe you can. 
And there was an expectation that the Messiah would do that, that the Messiah would heal leprosy. We're going to talk about in a moment, there were four classes of miracles that were messianic miracles. You know, the rabbis, the sages, they could pray for people, and there were miracles and there were healings because Israel had a covenant of healing with God. But there were four miracles that, that were only expected that the Messiah could do. One of them was healing leprosy. And uh, so he said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Aren't you glad we know his question? And it's a question that many have had. Many have understood. I believe that God has the power. I just don't know if he will heal me. I know he's healed to others, but will he heal me? And of course, the enemy has sowed in tares, you know, strange doctrines, wrong teaching, you know, We've been taught sometimes that, well, God gave you that sickness to teach you a lesson. Or that's your cross to bear, or that's to make you humble, or that's to make you holy. So what did Jesus answer? Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing. Hallelujah. Be cleansed. Now, I want you to notice that he didn't even say uh, be healed. He said be cleansed because leprosy was seen, and leprosy really is a type of sin. And leprosy was seen as a consequence, even more so than other types of sicknesses, as a death sentence. It was, they were called walking dead. And it was something that wasn't, didn't just need to be cleaned or, or healed, but rather that needed to be cleansed so that they could be healed. Immediately the leprosy left him and he charged him to tell no one. But go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing. Guess what? Here we have a sign pointing backwards to the Old Testament to guess what? A type. So Jesus says, don't tell anyone, but I want you to go to the temple. I want you to go to the priest. Show yourself to the priest because at this, there was a cleansing in Leviticus chapter 14 of what was to happen when a leper was healed. Now, the priests have this ceremony, but it's not something they did every day. Because people weren't being healed of leprosy. It's like, this is something you studied, but you never did. Like the students who studied the, the healing ceremony for someone who has recovered from leprosy, it's like, yeah, how often are we going to use this? Uh, and, the, and the older ones that have been teaching, oh, no, we've never used this. But when the Messiah comes, yeah. They had to learn it. So go and show yourself to the priest. And so when this man comes, the priests are going to be surprised, but they, they were command, this, this has been set up for them by God well in advance. Go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Isn't this cool? Because here is a leper who would be seen as unclean, he hasn't been able to even to go to the temple because he's unclean. I mean, this guy would be seen as a sinner, a walking dead, and he's going to go, and, but, but the fact that he's been cleansed of leprosy is a, a, a miracle that only God could do. And it's a testimony that, that the Messiah is here in Jesus. And the fact that this man goes to the temple, this is a testimony how many know that God can use your life no matter where you've come from? You may have been unclean, but God can use your life as a testimony to other people. And then look at Jesus says, just as Moses commanded. And I believe that Moses' command anticipated this moment. However, the report went around concerning him, Jesus, all the more. Now, this is stories also in other Gospels. Mark tells us that he went, Jesus said, don't tell anyone. 
He went right out and did the opposite and told everyone. And then it gives us the, the narrative that because of that, Jesus couldn't even go into that city anymore. It did change his ministry plan. I mean, it, crowds just, just thronged him. And it says he, and then he went out into the uh, wilderness to, to get by himself and pray. I mean, he had, he had to look for, he had, in other words, he had to on purpose get away sometimes and pray or just to have some peace. And, 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 and there's an amazing thing right there that, that, that God would do that for this man even though he's going to disobey afterwards and still tell everyone. Now, I don't think when Jesus said, don't tell anyone it was insincere. I really want you to tell everyone, but I'm going to tell you not to tell everyone. No. Yeah, that would be manipulation. So, but he still was good to him even though it was going to cause, uh, it was going to be harder for Jesus. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm just blown away by that. And of course, um, multitudes did come together. Look at what it says here. Great, and because of that, great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Just since we're there, what did they first come to, to receive from him? They came together for what? First of all, to hear. Hearing is involved with your healing. A lot of people want to jump right to the healing. But hearing, they came first, and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. So just to, let's review really quick, a type and an anti-type. You know, we have the picture of the handprint. You can put your hand in some ink and put a print the print that is left there is the type. And the hand, the real thing that the, that the, that the print comes from is the antitype. So in the Bible, there are types, there are events and people that were the type or the print pointing to, or another word for it is a shadow. And the real event that, that the shadow is, is a shadow of is the antitype. Now, it's a real event, too, in the Old Testament, but God orchestrated it to, to show us something about what was going to happen in the future. And so the print of the palm is the type. The hand that produced the print is the antitype. Now, this is theological language. I just want you to understand this word type and antitype, what they mean. Christ is the reality that produces the shadow, the various types or the copies or the handprints. Types and antitypes in the Bible are not accidental or coincidental. They are cases of obvious design and intent. In summary, again, we went through this, but a type must have at least five elements, a notable resemblance or correspondence between the type and the antitype, historical reality in both the type and the antitype, a prefiguring or predictive or prophetic foreshadowing of the antitype by the type and a heightening in which the antitype is greater than the type and divine design. And so we're going to look at another type. And the Old Testament is full of these. And every one of them is pointing to Jesus. And what are we looking for when we look at these types? We're looking for Jesus, and we're looking for what else? Healing. Yes, healing. Because if it's in the type, it's in the antitype. So let's go back and look at Leviticus 14, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, and by the way, I have uh, a uh, several-page commentary about chapter 14 that gets into the details of some of the symbols and the meanings of the ceremony that we're going to pass out tonight. Tanya, could you get, they're, they're on the chair back there. Could you get some of those and pass them out? So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, this shall be the ritual for the person at the time of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest. The priest shall go out of the camp. So the priest is going to meet the man who's been healed of leprosy outside the camp, not at the tabernacle, not at the temple, but outside the camp, outside of the town. If the... And the priest shall make an examination. So in this ritual, the priest is not bringing about healing. 
the priest is only examining and he's going to declare if this person has been healed or if he's not. If he says he's not, okay, you're still unclean, go back to the leper's camp. If the disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command that two living clean birds and cedar wood and crimson yarn and hyssop be brought for the one who is to be cleansed. The priest shall command that one of the birds be slaughtered over fresh water or, you know, some translations will say running water. What it, what it really is is living water. And so water that's running like a river, uh, a stream is called living water. But, of course, there's also meaning there. There's a river that's living water flowing from the throne. All right? So Jesus brings us living water. Uh, you know, stagnant water in a pond is, uh, is stagnant, and it's full of all kinds of yucky stuff, right? It gets dirty. So it needs to be fresh water in an earthen vessel. So one of the birds is killed over this clay pot, an earthen vessel that has living water in it, fresh water, and its blood is going to be dripping into that water, okay? He shall take the living bird with the cedar wood and the crimson yarn and the hyssop and dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was slaughtered over the fresh water. He shall sprinkle it, and so he's going to take this, this uh, hyssop branch uh, with the cedar wood and tie the, the scarlet yarn around this living bird with its tail down, and it's going to dip it in that water, and then he's going to uh, sprinkle seven times upon the one who's to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean. And he shall let the living bird go into the open field. The one who's to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off all his hair and bathe himself in water, and he shall be clean. After that, he shall come into the camp, but shall live outside his tent seven days. This way, everybody sees him and gets to inspect also that he's, that he's healed and clean. On the seventh day, he shall shave all of his hair again. And that it's easier to see your skin if you shaved all of the hair. But also there's a picture of being born again, becoming a new baby again. Then he shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water and shall be clean. Sadly, you know, many Christians don't uh, read these kinds of passages of these Old Testament rituals. Oh, that was for the Jews, you know, and... Uh, and they might say, oh, man, blood, birds, wood. Oh, God, I'm glad we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> but this was a type showing us the redemption that Christ would do. And so they just look at it as sometimes people have looked at it as insignificant, as a ritual that has nothing to do with us today. But it does have something to do with us today. Not that we do this ritual, but we see something in the ritual because we understand it was prefiguring the real redemption that Christ would do for us. And so there's nothing insignificant in the Bible, and there's nothing that the Lord told them to do that was without reason or without purpose. And so this is a type of Jesus. Now, just as we read through there, I'm sure you might have noticed some things that like, okay, since you know the New Testament... You know, oh, there's some things in there that I think I know what that's connected with. We got cedar wood, blood, water, every one of these. And so the whole process of this ritual is in the instance of someone who's been physically healed. What triggers this ritual? Somebody being physically healed. Now, there's implications in this ritual of spiritual rebirth, of, of spiritual redemption, the forgiveness of our sins, becoming a new person. But the original context is healing of a death sentence incurable disease. And so this man had been leprous, or again, full of leprosy. And leprosy in the Old Testament describes a number of different diseases uh, and some different than what we talk about today. But it is terminal and it was called a living death. They lost feeling in their skin and body. There are stories of people who have their hands in the fire and they're burning up and they didn't even know it. Like if your hand was in the fire, you know, that's handy for somebody to 
put out the candles, but just kidding. They couldn't even feel it, you know. Uh, that would be a nice trick at parties, put the fire into your hand and like see how, you know, see who can last longer. People would break an ankle and just keep walking, not even know it. They lost feeling. So their faces and ears and fingers and extremities and feet, a lot of times they, they would lose limbs. They would lose fingers. This is a dreadful thing. And, and actually, uh, pain is an indicator to you. Stop doing that. If you don't have pain, so even pain has a purpose, and so this disease has to do with your flesh actually dying while you're still alive. It's a horrible thing. And so when a person was this way, it was considered contagious, and they were put outside of the city, and they lived out on their own in the bush or in a, in a leper, leper colony. And uh, it was a horrible death. So this healing, though, of, of this Jewish leper by Jesus that we just read in Luke, it's in Mark also, chapter 1. This healing of the Jewish leper is one of the four messianic miracles that was expected that the Messiah would do. There were miracles that the Jews believed that only the Messiah could perform. The Babylonian uh, Talmud says a leper was considered dead, and the Babylonian Sanhedrin said the restoring of the dead to life was the greatest of miracles. And so from that logic, th this event was considered only, only to be done by the Messiah. So like if you were uh, full of leprosy and you came to the rabbis, you know, the high priest, they would say, you need to wait, you need to pray for the Messiah to come. And so from the time of the Mosaic law was completed, there was no record of any Jewish person who had been cleansed of leprosy. Mary and Moses' sister was healed before the giving of at Sinai of the law. And... Um, Naaman, who was a Gentile and a Syrian general, he had leprosy cleansed, but he was not a Jew, and he was um, he didn't go to this ceremony because he wasn't Jewish. He didn't go to the tabernacle. And so leprosy was the one disease that rabbis could not cure miraculous through prayer. They could pray and, and have other diseases healed, but there was absolutely no cure for leprosy whatsoever. The Jews called leprosy the finger of God or the stroke indicating they believed and regarded this disease to be a direct punishment from God and incurable and that it was a death sentence from God. In other words, you've done something so horrible, God has condemned you to die alone with your body dying as you walk. And so the only way for this to be cured was, is by divine power, which had first permitted it. So the Bible treats leprosy as a disease that is a result of sin a pollution and a defilement. And so its removal isn't just healing, it's cleansing. And leprosy was something that made per people unclean. You could have some other sickness and not be unclean, but this one made you unclean. And uh, so there were four uh, messianic miracles. Number one was healing people of genetic blindness. In other words, those who were born blind. So remember when Jesus healed the man that was born blind, they said, we've never heard of this. We've never seen this. That was a messianic miracle. In other words, like if, if somebody didn't even have eyes, if they, or if they didn't have everything in the eye, that's not healing. You need, you need some parts created. Then uh, number two was casting out mute demons. When the person with the demon couldn't speak, the rabbis couldn't cast the, that devil out. But Jesus did. And so you look at those stories. When he cast out the mute spirit, they were really in awe because he could cast out mute demons even. There were Jewish exorcists that would try to cast out other types but again, if you went to the seven sons of Sceva and they said it's a mute demon, they like, no, you're gonna have to wait for the Messiah. <laughs> and then number three would be the healing of leprosy. And then number four was raising the dead after three days. 
Jesus on purpose waited for the fourth day to raise Lazarus. Because the Jews believed that the soul, the, the spirit of the dead person hovered around, stayed around the dead body for three days, but after that, then it would leave. In other words, so for Jesus to raise Lazarus, he, he's, he's bringing him back from Shoal, back to his body. So when Jesus healed the leper, this is quite a testimony then. It's a testimony that Jesus is the Messiah. When this man goes to the temple for this ritual, he's going uh, as a testimony that the Messiah just healed me. So here comes a man. He, he's got his life back. As soon as he's going to go through this ceremony, he can go back home. He can go back to his wife and kids. He can go back to his job. He can worship in the sanctuary again. Uh, he's got his life back. He's been healed. He's cleansed. And, and uh, so this says, the, the, then shall the priest take for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean. And so these are birds that are suitable to eat or to offer as a sacrifice at the temple. They're clean birds. And uh, so is there any wood involved in redemption? Yeah, there's the cross that Jesus is attached to. He's nailed to, right? The master was hung on a tree. He was nailed to wood. And scarlet, was there scarlet at redemption? They put a scarlet robe on him. And, of course, he, his blood was this color. Matthew 27, 28 says they put a scarlet robe on him and they spit on him and slapped him and mocked him. And hyssop, was there hyssop at redemption? Well, Remember at the Passover, hyssop was the branch you dipped into the blood of the lamb to put on your door. And was there hyssop at Jesus' redemption? Yes. When they lifted him, him the sponge with the vinegar, they put it on a hyssop branch to lift it up to him. They used, um, let me see, so we got cedar wood, scarlet and hyssop and verse 5 continues and the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel now these birds are are heavenly creatures they fly in the air which points to their origin not so much of birds but birds often represent spiritual creatures and in a negative context or or a good context why is the holy spirit pictured as the symbol of a dove because he comes from heaven the bad birds uh, that pick out flesh that live off the dead are pictured as evil spirits. So, in other words, this bird has come down from heaven. Jesus is the man that has come down from heaven. And he was born into an earthen vessel. We are made of clay, the Bible says. Right? The Bible calls us earthen vessels. And so this bird that comes down from heaven, Jesus comes down from heaven, he's going to be born into an earthen vessel and he's going to be killed in his earthen vessel. And that's what the master did. He was born into this earth in an earthen vessel and he was killed. The Bible says they were to kill that bird over clean, fresh running water as opposed to stagnant water. They took this bird and killed it and the blood ran out into the water. One bird is dead. This was done inside an earthen vessel. The other bird is still alive. They take the other remaining bird uh, in their hand with the cedar wood, the scarlet, and the hyssop and plunge them underneath the blood and the water and they bring them up with the blood and the water dripping off of them. A live bird, a piece of cedar wood, a scarlet cloth and, and hyssop and they sprinkle the one that's to be cleansed with this water and blood concoction. It's a little gross. But the redemption that Jesus did is a little gross. It's a bloody Hallelujah, man. We, we sling blood. And so he's slinging blood. And guess what? Today, you can sling the blood of Jesus and change things. And so to, to, to sprinkle them seven times means a, a, a perfect application, a perfect redemption, a complete application of redemption. And then they go out into an open field in a wide open space and take that cedar wood and that scar and that hiss up and they let that bird go free and it flies away back up to heaven. 
that water-washed, blood-washed bird that's alive because the other bird died. And now, of course, Jesus died and then is resurrected. And so it represents Jesus, but that other live bird represents you baptized into the blood and the water of Jesus. And you're set free. Woo! Then the one who was clean uh, went... Uh, um, well, so Jesus, he was pierced in his side and blood and water flowed out. The price was paid and judgment was satisfied. Redemption was purchased and reconciliation was made. So let's look at a couple things here uh, to connect to the real thing from the type. The priest was to go meet this man and this ceremony was done outside the camp, not at the temple. Jesus, look at the next slide. Jesus was sacrificed outside the camp. Jesus was the man from heaven. Jesus remained cleansed and holy even in his death, becoming sin without becoming a sinner because the bird was clean. The next one, Jesus came by water and blood in 1 John 5, 6 and died in association with blood and water. Jesus died in association also with scarlet cloth. Jesus died in association connected to wood. Jesus died in association with hyssop. David said, when he sinned, cleanse me with hyssop. Jesus lived bearing the marks of his death. So after the resurrection, he still bears the marks of his death. And so the bird that was dipped into the blood was to bear the mark of the dead bird. Then Jesus ascended to heaven out of human sight as that bird would do. And so again, there's a sense in which the living bird set free points to the resurrected Jesus, but it also points to the one healed and free from their leprosy, including the leprosy of sin and their resurrected and free in the resurrected Jesus to live eternally. So if there's a heightening here in that you get more than just healing from leprosy. You get born again with a recreated spirit and forgiven, and you get to live forever with God in paradise. You get to go to heaven too. And so there's a heightening. It's even bigger and better in the real thing. But the type included also the physical healing of a physical disease. And so if it's in the type, it's in the antitype. And so now anybody who will look up from their dirty, broken, sick, unclean, and dead condition and say, I believe on Jesus, <clears throat> if they're dipped into the blood of that bird, if they're dipped into the water that the dead bird was in, guess what? The healing and the cleanliness of the bird that died gets on the, the bird that was sick. I'm seeing Jesus as the Lord of my life and I will let him by the power of the Holy Spirit put his great hand on me and combine me with the work of the cross, with the work of redemption and the cleansing of the Holy Spirit. Woo! And take them and I'll be blood washed, bought and water washed and set me free. Amen. To rule and reign... In light, so, uh, so later on in the passage, what happens is then they're going to take the blood of that dead bird and put it on the right ear and the right thumb and the right big toe of the one who's cleansed with leprosy. Then they're going to take oil and put it on top of the blood that was on the right ear and the right thumb and the right big toe. And so that blood would be applied to everything you're going to hear now. I'm, I'm going to put priority to his words. And everything I'm going to do is going to, I'm going to put priority to what, what God does and what he's called me to do. And then I'm going to be led, by, and the priority in my life now is to go where he sends me. And so my whole life, everything I'm going to, going to hear that's going to enter into me, everything that I'm going to do, everywhere I'm going to go, has been cleansed by Jesus, and now I'm anointed by the Holy Spirit. And this is even different than what was done in the priest dedication. Oil was poured on them. Oil would be poured on the king. 
And so with this uh, person who had been cleansed of leprosy, blood on the right ear, the right thumb, and the big toe, and then oil on the, right, on the right ear, the right thumb, and the big toe, and then the remaining oil poured over the top of them, which is declaring that the one who's been born again through the redemption of Jesus Christ will reign in life as a priest and as a king. Amen. Woo! So it's even bigger and better in the fulfillment than what was to be for the man healed by leprosy. It's pointing forward to someone who was dead in sin, who would be born again and made alive, but now they're alive as a king and a priest and dedicated to the service of God. Hallelujah. Wow. I love it. So... Is this a type of Jesus? Yes. Why were they doing it? Why were they even having the ceremony? And they're having this ceremony because somebody got healed of a physical condition, pointing to everyone who would be healed of a spiritual condition, but also it, that'll bring healing to anyone with a physical condition, right? If the type healed you of a physical disease, and the antitype heals you of even more than that, but it will also heal you of the physical part. Thank you, Lord. And this is even being healed of something that was a death sentence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So this goes into some more detail in this um, thing that you can, this um, printout that you can take and study and learn it, and I want you to share it with other people. The fact that God weaved this in such detail into the Old Testament ritual. And it was to give us a confidence that the real redemption that it was pointing to, it would show us that God really had, according to his own good pleasure, planned this out and thought this out in this kind of detail that, that is going to benefit you completely and thoroughly. I love it. <laughs> so even in this type, we see ascending to heaven. We see getting anointed by the Holy Spirit, which, which, remember, the anointing could only happen after the blood's been applied. You have to become born again, and then the Holy Spirit can fill you and come upon you. And we see that in the type. And we see it in the real thing when we study the New Testament books. When we get into the book of Acts, you know, and we, and we look at Jesus himself. And so when Jesus is healing this man full of leprosy, and it doesn't matter how full he is, because Jesus knows I'm about to show, I'm about to lay down on these people the antitype of Leviticus 14. Amen. Woo! And so he's so excited to say, oh, don't go tell anybody. I want you to go to the temple. I want you to offer the sacrifice because this is going to knock them off their their rabbinical seats. This is going to knock the, the high priest hat off his head. <laughs> it's like, they, and they, they had to go get Leviticus 14. <laughs> what are we supposed to do? We haven't had to do this before. <laughs> and the Bible specifically, explicitly says he was full of leprosy. Well, this is a, that's an advanced case of a death sentence disease. Hallelujah. But of course, our sin disease was a death sentence. We were walking dead without God, without Christ. But now he's had mercy and we said, Lord, would you save me? I will be a brand new creation Woo! Hallelujah. Oh, we praise you, Jesus. Thank you for being willing to die. Thank you, Lord, for immersing us in the blood and the water of our Savior and Master Jesus Christ. Thank you for sprinkling us and slinging his blood upon us 
to make us new, to heal us and redeem us. Thank you also for, for anointing us with your Holy Spirit and with power, making us kings and priests unto our God. We thank you also, Lord, that healing, you're generous to give to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. We bless you. The love of God be with you. The grace of Christ be upon you. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit be in every day of your life. And the Lord God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you and preserve you. And the Lord pour out his favor and his strength and his grace upon you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom peace everywhere you go as he leads and guides you in life in Jesus name. Amen.